Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible, Bible Talk. Talk. And hey. on behalf of Alice and myself, and all of us at Bible Talk, we want to greet you in the wonderful, the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Amen. Jesus Christ. Amen. Name above all names. The, the name above all names. Yes. And we're continuing on. We're actually, we're at, we're at the, about the conclusion of our study of that prayer that Jesus taught his disciples as a model for prayer mm -hmm. in the Sermon on the Mount, which is commonly called the Our Father. Okay? Um, we're looking at the very, very last part of it now. In the last couple of weeks, we have looked at that conclusion where Jesus said, For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. So in this program, we're going to be looking at for thine is the glory, God's Hallelujah. glory. God's glory. But before that, Alice is first of all going to pray and ask God's blessing on our time together. together. Hallelujah. Father, we do. We praise you. We thank you. We bless your holy name. And we come before you, Lord, with thanksgiving in yes, our Lord. hearts. And we ask you, Lord, to guide and direct every word that comes out yes, of our Lord. mouths. And we ask, and we know that that word will go forth and accomplish what you and want it to do what you intended to do. And we pray that the hearts that are hearing this will be receptive and open to hear your word and do your word. Amen. Amen. And Father, I ask that nothing would come out of my mouth that you have not put into my heart. Amen. Hallelujah. And I'll say this again, just a little bit of business. Don't trust me. Don't take my word for anything. Test what I say. That's right. Test what I say, but test it against the Word of God. That is the only measuring stick. Amen. That is indeed that plumb line yes. that God showed yes, Amos. Hallelujah. Before we start, I just wanted to do this. I wanted to talk about the fact that when we started this particular program, In Search of Christianity, some, well, I guess about a year and a month or so ago, I don't really remember Quite a while back. Quite a while back. Mm -hmm. I, I had said that the purpose of this was that we would seek normal Christianity. Yes. Defined by the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. That's a Christianity that so, seems so far away from what mm -hmm. has become today's common Christianity. Yes, absolutely. And there is a difference between what is common in Christianity and what should be normal in Christianity today. I mean, Alice and I have been blessed. As a matter of fact, this year alone, we have we have traveled to I think twenty states and fourteen countries, mm -hmm. sharing the gospel, teaching, preaching, and doing whatever God, yes. the Spirit of God, leads us yes. to. Getting to meet the rest of the family. Yeah, but one of the things that we see, and I mean, this may sound harsh, but you, you tested. Most Bible-believing Christians simply don't believe the Bible. That's true. Mm -hmm. Oh, I mean, they'll believe the parts they like, but when it gets to the parts that they're not so pleasant to them. They stop believing, okay? And that's not acceptable, I promise you. So it certainly becomes understandable to see that the church of Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3, the letter that Jesus gave to that church, which is the last picture of a church on earth, to see that as the last day's apostasy that was told, foretold by Jesus in Matthew 24, and by the Apostle Paul in his second letter to the Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, and read chapter 2 and see what I'm talking about. You see, that assembly in Laodicea proclaimed that they had everything. They had need of nothing. But they lacked Jesus Christ. Yes. He was standing outside. He proclaimed that because they were neither hot nor cold but lukewarm, he would vomit them out of his mouth. Mm -hmm. That assembly of last days so, or even this assembly of mm. last days, so-called Christians, literally made Jesus sick to his stomach. This same Jesus who gave himself up, gave himself up an offering unto death on a cross for the church, so that he might sanctify her, 
having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. That's Ephesians 5, 26 and 27. So Jesus is coming not for those who are hot on Sunday, cold on Monday, and lukewarm throughout their lives, but for the remnant, the bondservants of the Lord. Jesus said, this is Luke 18, 8. Jesus said, I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Faith is only seen in obedience. And that's surely what James meant when he wrote, Even so faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. James 2, 17 and 18. Think about this. In that great faith chapter, Hebrews 11, it says, By faith, Abraham, when he was, when he was called, obeyed. Hebrews 11, 8. You see that? Abraham, all who are of the faith, it says, you know, have Abraham for that, that natural right. father, right? By faith, he obeyed. I shared this with uh, some people in Ireland the other day, and I, I think they initially thought, well, that's heresy. Yeah? Because I said, the blessings of God don't come by faith. No, obedience comes by faith. The so blessings come by obedience. Faith leads to obedience. Obedience leads to the promises of God. Now, if, you don't, if that sounds like heresy to you, I, I beg you, I plead with you, go and have a conversation with the Lord about it. You see, it's about doing what you've heard from the Word. The Word who was made flesh and dwelt among us. And doing that for the glory of God. And he's very clear about that in Deuteronomy 28. Very clear. Deuteronomy 28. Read the whole thing, all right? Absolutely. What we do, we have to do for the glory of God. That's exactly what Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, when he said, Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And that's where we are in this study. For thine is the glory. Jesus said, And do not lead us in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Matthew 6, 13. What is glory? What's glory? That's a good question. That's a good question. You know, this is interesting because I went on dictionary.com. And on dictionary.com they say, all English speakers likely know this word. Okay. I'll buy that. I mean, you say glory, and every Christian has heard, or every person has heard that word. Every English speaker. That doesn't mean that they understand it. The dictionaries that they use define it as this. Very great praise, honor, or distinction. Something that is a source of honor, fame, or admiration, an object of pride. Resplendent beauty, Resplendent beauty or magnificence, exaltation, fame. You see, there is a glory that people and things can have, but it's not the glory, right? It's not his glory. In Isaiah 42, 8, God said, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. Hello. And then in, later in chapter 48, verse 11, it says, For my own sake, for my own sake, I will act. For how can my name be profaned? And my glory I will not give to another. Mm. You see, there are glorious things in the world. You believe that? Yes. Because it says in Matthew 4, 8, again, the devil took him, Jesus, to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. That's right. Right? So there are things in the world that can have glory, magnificent, resplendent. Mm -hmm. Okay? A sunrise over the ocean. That's glorious. I mean, Alice and I lived years ago down in Miami in a high rise overlooking the ocean. And we would wake up, our bedroom faced, faced east, and we would wake up watching, or at least half of us would wake up. I, I, caught, okay. it. I caught it a few okay. times. Wake up and watch that ball of fire rising over the horizon, over the water. It's, it can be breathtaking. 
It's like every day you start with a new canvas that God has painted. It's amazing. It is amazing. It's glorious, all right? His creation is yes. glorious. Think about in the mountains. I mean, we have, we have been in the, the mountains. We've been in the Rocky Mountains, well, through the Rocky Mountains. We've been in the Swiss and, and French Alps and the Pyrenees, okay? It was uh, Kathy, Catherine Lee Bates in the late 1800s who wrote that song, America, which is uh, America, America, and talks about Purple Mountain's majesty. It is majestic. That's, there's no doubt about it. I mean, as I say, we've traveled around the world. We have seen the handiwork of the Lord. We were coming back from Italy on, on one trip, okay. driving back, coming to England. And um, you go to Italy, and everybody goes there, and they see the massive cathedrals and everything, and it's uh, basically tourist attractions at this point. But we were coming back through the Alps, and it had rain, and it was like a thousand waterfalls all over, all the, all over the mountains. Yeah. And we stopped at one of the service plazas on the Autobahn there in Switzerland. And as we were coming out, it was sun. It was just time for sunset. And there was a father and a son right in front of Alice and I. And they walked out the door, and this little boy stopped dead in his tracks. He was about four years old. And he looked. He said, marvelous. Marvelous. <laughs> to see the sun there in the, in the Alps. Yeah. It was incredible. That's not the work of man's hands, I promise you. Yeah. It's, you know. So God said he will not give. Nor, or call a person or a graven image glorious. That's right. Okay? He can, however, al allow the sunrise, the mountains, the moon and the stars to be called glorious mm -hmm. because they reveal His glory. The heavens proclaim the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. Psalm 19. Mm -hmm. They declare His glory because it's His work. That's right. And in Romans 1.20, this, this should become obvious to us. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Romans 1.20. We should see the glory of God in his creation. Because the spiritual man appraises all things spiritually, because they're, they're spiritually appraised. The work of God is spiritually appraised, right? King Solomon who was gifted with wisdom and riches unlike others, mm -hmm. had glory. Yes. Yeah, he did. I know because Jesus said mm -hmm. glory that was put in perspective by Jesus. Mm -hmm. And he said, why are you worried about clothing? Mm -hmm. Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. Matthew 6, 28 and 29. So you see, there's glorious things in the world, but men give other men glory. Is that not true? Yes. All right? It says in Luke 14, 10, But when you are invited, go and recline at the last place, so that when the one who has invited you comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will have honor. Now the Darby version of the Bible says glory. The King James says worship. But it's the exact same word that has been used all the times I've mentioned in the New Testament. Doxa, for, for glory, the Greek word, right? Earlier here in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus warned about receiving glory, about receiving honor from other men. Listen to these. This is all from the Sermon on the Mount, right? So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men, receive glory from men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. Matthew 6, 2. And then in the fifth verse, Jesus says, When you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. They've gotten glory from men, but not from God. And then in verse 16, Jesus goes on to say, Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they're fasting. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. You don't want to get glory from men if it means that that's your reward in full. I want, I want, I want to hear from the Lord on that day, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's what I want. You see, Jesus, 
who spoke nothing on his own, who did nothing on his own, said, I do not receive glory from men. John 5, 41. And neither should we. But we should do what we do not, whatever we do, right? Not to be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Right. Matthew 6, 18. This is all the Sermon on the Mount. The teaching that Jesus Christ gave as the basic teaching and training in righteousness before he sent those, those apostles and disciples out to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Right. <clears throat> because he had said just a, a, a little bit earlier in this teaching, he said, to God be the glory, he said, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Matthew 5, 16. So yes, people should see what we do, but we should be doing it in a way that they see it as the glory of God the Father. Why? Because you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Colossians 3, 3. They don't see you. We are to bring the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus into every place. So when we start doing that, if anything, any praise, if any honor, any glory, it should go to our God. We should run from, we should hide from, hide in Christ, the glory of men that can stoke the fires of pride. And trust me, that's what they'll do. When men say, oh, ain't you doing good? They have to be corrected every time. Yes, because you know what? People say to us all the time, how are you doing? You doing good? Are you good? No, we're not good. We are righteous. We are the very righteousness of God in Christ Jesus because of what He yes, has no. done. Nothing that we no, nothing, done. Nothing from us. So <sighs> we, we have to become less visible. How do, you, how do you become less visible? By dying to yourself. But see, pride, like I said, when people give you honor, when people give you glory, it stokes the fire of pride. Yes, but we've been called to show forth the excellence of our God, who is a consuming fire. You know, this starts, I'll take it back to Exodus, Exodus 24, verses 16 and 17. By the way, it wouldn't hurt if you had a pencil and paper and, and jotted down these verse references as I do it. Because, you know, we had a dear brother over in uh, North Wales, over in Penman Mawa in North Wales, who's going on to be with the Lord, Arthur Burke. And he used to say, the meeting doesn't start right. until the meeting ends. That's right. You know, it, I, I thank God for this opportunity that we can meet, right. even though it's across the airways or across the internet. But the fact is, if you're going to have this become the word that you're hearing, and I pray that you're hearing mm -hmm. word here, it's, it's got to be confirmed by the Lord God, by the Holy Spirit that you have within you. So after this is all done, take some time Go back and, read and think about questions. what you've heard yeah. and converse with the Lord. Mm -hmm. um, that's called prayer, by the way. Okay? Conversation with the Lord. The glory of the Lord. Mm -hmm. The glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses from the midst of the cloud, and to the eyes of the sons of Israel, the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the mountaintop. Mm -hmm. Exodus 24, 16 and 17. Mm -hmm. Our God is a consuming fire, it says in Hebrews. And it's a fire that brings, oh, it'll bring absolute glory to his name. But it's the lukewarm church that I spoke of at the start of the study that Paul warned Timothy of, saying, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and turn aside to myths. Mm -hmm. 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4. These are the... Go ahead. I just want to say that when we were first saved, we would hear this scripture a lot. But in this day and age, this is so... True. I so mean, it obvious. Was so obvious, yes. It wasn't as obvious when we were first saved in the, back in the right. 70s, but it is now. I mean, it is so, so true. Well, that's because what we're seeing today, I mean, it's, listen, it's not new, no. but it's a matter of, I think, of quantity, how much we're seeing exactly. it. Yeah. That churches and ministers and ministries, 
the focus on self-esteem, self-growth, yes. wealth, and worldly happiness, making people feel, feel good, good about themselves, yeah. refusing to preach the same message that John the Baptist did, preparing the way for the Lord. And you know what? You better be prepared for the coming of the Lord. He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 3, 2. That's the same message that Jesus preached, right? In the next chapter, in Matthew 4, verse 17, Jesus said, from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. I see so many, we travel around, as I said, you know, you, if you know us, you know how much traveling we do. I mean, we've just come back from a long trip. <laughs> We're still in the midst of a long trip. As a matter of fact, we're still over here. We're in Manchester, England at the moment. And we're seeing Christians who still want to have their ears tickled right. and is, are being swayed by this, measure, by this message that's so comfortable to the flesh. And instead of repenting, they're making excuses. Making excuses. How much do you hear it preach? That we are called to die to ourselves. Die to ourselves. There is a constant battle going on. Constant conflict between your flesh and your spirit. You know, we can talk about the glory of the Lord. But in fact, remember it says in Isaiah that your sin separates you from God. Yes. If there's any sin and you've not repented of it, that separates you from God, it's going to separate you from His glory, I promise you. Because the glory of the Lord is about the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. That's right. When the presence disappeared, and people, you know, they can think because of tradition. They can think of because of where they've been or where their parents have been that you guarantee the glory of God. Yeah. Think about the time when the, when the Ark of the Covenant was yes. captured by the Philistines. And uh, they, they came back saying that they'd been defeated. And this, she, was, she was about to have a baby boy. Yeah. And she called the boy Ichabod. Saying, the glory has departed from Israel because the ark of God was taken and because of her father-in-law and her husband. She said, the glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God was taken. 1 Samuel 4, 21 and 22. You see, kabod in, in Hebrew is the word for glory. Ichabod means it's gone. It's not, there's no glory, all right? Are we seeing the glory of God? I mean, we're seeing big buildings. We're seeing big congregations. We're seeing massive rallies. But are we seeing the glory, that consuming fire of God? That's the question. Because, and let me just, okay. Ready? Take it back. <laughs> Ezekiel chapter 11. I'm going to read verses 22 and 23. Write it down. Check it out. Then the cherubim lifted up their wings with the wheels beside them. And the glory of the God of Israel hovered over them. The glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood over the mountain, which is east of the city. You know, I, I've shared this with people, and it's a, well, put a strange look on your face. But I ask you to pray about it and test it. When Jesus died on that cross, the veil was rent from top to bottom. It wasn't the work of man, it was the work of God. And people have all kinds of theories about, you know, what that was all about. That all of a sudden, the, you know, what had been blocked by that incredible veil in the Holy of Holies, where the presence of God was, where the name of God dwelt. All of a sudden, you, you can think about, well, was it to let people in? No, it wasn't to let people in. It was to let God's glory out. And Jesus, over on that mountain to the east, the Mount of Olives, he departed from this earth there, and he said he was coming back there. The glory, the glory, we'll see, will be on the mountain to the east, not on the mountain of the temple. You know, this is about, it's about Jesus, all right? Yes, it is. Moses said, I'm going to read from Exodus again, Exodus 33, starting in verse 18. Then Moses said, I pray you show me your glory. He's talking to God in his prayers. God, show me your glory. And God said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. This is the Father 
God Almighty. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and you shall stand there on the rock, and it will come about while my glory is passing by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and cover you with my hand until I pass by. Then I will take my hand away, and you shall see my back, and my face shall not be seen. Jesus is the rock of our salvation. He is that place where we are supposed to dwell in the cleft of the rock, in Christ Jesus. And, you know, when the church is operating, the way the church is supposed to operate, the prophecy of Habakkuk, Habakkuk, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Habakkuk 2.14. And think about this. This is Paul writing to the church at Rome. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus, so that with one voice, with one accord, you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 15, 5 and 6. You know, we talked a lot in the last few weeks about division in the body of Christ and the effects of division. But you must understand that if we don't have that unity that Christ died to purchase for us, we will not be glorifying God the Father as we're intended to. That's, that's a simple truth. There's no way around that. You can't, you can't say, well, okay, that was for then and this is for now. No. The Word of God is eternal. The Word of God is the same yesterday, today, and yes, forever. If we don't put aside, repent of, the division that exists between us, we will never lift with one voice and glorify God the Father. Why? The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God because a faithful church has carried the love and the word of God throughout the world. And this is going to happen before the end. Jesus said this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations and then the end will come. Matthew 24, 14. You know, to bring this whole thing full circuit, circle right where we started from, when Paul said, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. It doesn't matter what you're doing. This is true when you're at work. When, not just when you're in a church building, because it built, by the way, that building is not the church. We are the church, built with living stones by the hand of God. No pastor ever built a church. No apostle ever built a church. Jesus Christ said, I will build my church. Amen. Okay? We're there, the, the ministers, the people. Going to get me self going here. Yeah, All Christians. A-L-L. Capital A, capital L, capital L. All Christians have a ministry. We are all called to serve him. We are all called to proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light, that he might be glorified. Father, I pray Thank you, Jesus. that when we see your son, because this is your word, when we see him coming in the clouds, we will see him with great power and with great glory. Thank you, Jesus. And Lord, I know that that time is not far off. And I know that it's your desire that none should perish, but all come to that knowledge of you that brings eternal life. So Lord, I pray that we would be faithful, not thinking about ourselves, but thinking about the mission we've been called to, to share your love, to share your word, Lord God, that other might come, others might come to know you. Hallelujah. For the time, I believe, truly is running short, Lord God. Give us a heart to serve. Give us a passion to serve you, that you might be glorified, Lord. We praise you and thank you that you can still use the foolish things of this world to shame the wisdom of the wise. Amen. 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 Well, until next time, I pray that it will be upon your heart and in your mind to serve God in a way that will bring glory to His name. God bless you and goodbye till next time. So I'm